Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. If we could have someone here in the class just open for us with a word of prayer, uh, then we can start our session, please. Father, we thank you for this time. And Lord, as we're going to start our class, Father, help us to learn through this course, Father. So, man, Lord Jesus, thank you. We ask your wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yes. Welcome, everyone. Um, so, last week we were looking at John chapter 4 and John chapter 5. So, today we will be getting into John chapters 6 and 7. Uh, so, if we could have someone read out for us the first few verses in John chapter 6, mm, then maybe we can begin. Uh, so, in John chapter 6, if we could have someone read out for us uh, verses 1 to 7. Yeah, John chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Uh, if someone could read out for us, please. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were deceased. And Jesus went up on a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near, and Jesus lifted, lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to taste him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. Yeah, let's look at these first few verses. Um, it says here that Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. And now, why did he do that? We don't really have any explanation given over here. Uh, but then, uh, if we want to know the background to this passage, we would find that in Luke. So, if we were to go to Luke chapter 9, verses 10 to 11, we get to know that uh, this event is taking place after Jesus had sent out his disciples two by two to do ministry in different places. Uh, they were sent out to preach and to heal. And they have come back from their uh, mission trip. And so now Jesus wants to spend time, some time with them, encouraging them, uh, talking to them, uh, you know, so that they can sit together and discuss all that has happened during the mission trip. So this is supposed to be a quiet personal time just for Jesus and his little group, um, you know, for them to uh, recover and um, talk. But... The crowd gets to know that he's here, and so then they come over here to, uh, you know, hear from him. Uh, so even though Jesus really wanted um, to be alone with the disciples for some time, he is unable to get that opportunity, and um, he graciously welcomes them. That is what we see in Luke chapter 9, verse 11, where it says, uh, the crowds learned about him and followed him. He, he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. <laughs> in um, John chapter 6, in, in fact, it says that they were a great crowd of people. So where did this large crowd of people come from? Here in our John account, we are told in verse 4 that the Jewish Passover festival was near. So all of this crowd seems to be moving towards Jerusalem. You know, all the people from different regions of Galilee are going towards Jerusalem to participate in the Passover feast. Uh, so, right now, spiritual things are on their mind. They are hungry to know about spiritual truths. And so, when they hear that Jesus is here somewhere in this region, they immediately search him out and they come to him. So, Jesus, even though, you know, his schedule, uh, his timetable was something else, he was planning on spending quiet time with his uh, disciples, he decides to welcome them and teach them spiritual matters. Uh, so, 
it says in verse 5 that Jesus sees this great crowd coming and then he says to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And in the verse, uh, verse 6, it is clarified. He asked this only to test him. In what way was Jesus testing Philip? What did Jesus wish to convey? Um, if you um, remember, these people have just come back from a very successful mission trip. And in the mission trip, this was the instruction which they had been given. You know, uh, to go back to Luke chapter 9, uh, verses 3 to 5. Yeah, in fact, maybe we could have someone read out that. Luke chapter 9, verses 3 to 5, if someone could read out. That should give us uh, some background about uh, why Jesus was testing Philip. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither st stuffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. These were the instructions which had been given before the mission trip. Um, so they did not take any money. They did not take any food. Everything was provided by the people that they ministered to. God arranged for them in such a way that there was no lack. Whatever they required for their mission trip was provided by different, different people. Uh, so now Jesus is putting to test all that Philip has learned during the mission trip. And so now Jesus asks him, all these people are coming to us. From where are we going to get bread for them? So if Philip had really been um, applying what he has learned during the mission trip, he would have confidently replied and said, in the same way the Lord provided for us during the mission trip, he will now provide for the crowd would have been Philip's response. But he has not yet absorbed the lessons which were learnt during that mission trip. So it is still not gotten into his inner being. He saw God's provision in a, in a wonderful way during the journey. He has tasted of God's goodness, but it has not quite sunk in to an extent where he will expect the same from the Lord for all future occasions. That has not yet happened. And so he says, you know, even if we had half a year's wages, that's quite a large amount of money, and we used all of that amount to buy bread, at the most, maybe each person would get one bite. That's it. So that's that's the size of the crowd, uh, of this large crowd, which, which actually is moving towards uh, Jerusalem for the feast. And um, so... Uh, after um, he, you know, Philip gives his remarks, we move from there into what Andrew says and then the things which happen after that. So if we could have someone read out for us all the way from verse 8 and uh, we can go uh, right up to uh, verse 11. So verses 8 to 11, if someone could read out for us. Verse 8. One of, the, one of his disciples, Andrew, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those who were sitting down, and likewise to the fish as much as they wanted. So Andrew replies in the same way, more or less, that Philip had replied. He said, yeah, I managed to find one boy and he seems to have five. You know, the description here is so clear. It says five small barley loaves and two small fish. So first of all, it's just five loaves. And even those five loaves are small in size and it's just two fish. Those two fish are also small in size. So he says, how far will it go, you know, to, to feed an entire crowd? Um, so that uh, is the assessment of both Philip and Andrew. And uh, 
this is not a situation which they had really anticipated right i mean uh, they were in fact supposed to have a quiet time together as a small group they were not prepared to start providing provisions for a, for a huge crowd so sometimes we will not always have control over the circumstances and situations which come into our life things happen unexpectedly and um, we are not prepared for what happens and what is in our hands at that point of time may be very limited very less uh, in this particular case what is in their hands you know they have um, they were actually supposed to go away to a place together and then maybe think about food and look for you know buy something from there right now there's nothing in their hands their hands are empty and uh, there in the crowd they have only been able to find one boy who has caught five loaves and two fish but what is jesus response um with what is available it says in verse 11 jesus took the loaves gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated so even though what was in their hands right now was very very less first of all jesus thanks god for what is available and in faith he steps out and starts distributing that little bit which is available and it turns out that that little bit is sufficient to feed the entire crowd so we cannot always control what's going to come into our lives the situations and circumstances that are going to come um you know but when those situations come what is in our hands at that particular moment what you have in your hands is what god has placed in your hands because god has not been surprised by the circumstances which have come into your life god already knew those circumstances would come into your life so beforehand he has already placed something in your hands but that something may be very small it may seem very insufficient but you still have that and what did jesus do with that little he gave thanks for it fully recognizing that god almighty is in control so thank the lord for whatever you do have in that situation which you are facing and step out in faith and start doing the best that you can with that little which you have and the rest of it god will take care of i mean that is his responsibility so um you know it may be a crisis that you're facing in your family or maybe your family is going through some very difficult situation so what do you have in your hands you may not have what is required to resolve the entire crisis but whatever you do have thank the lord for it and step out in faith and know that you have the lord's backing and start working towards resolving that issue and the lord will step in and take care of the rest of it in the same way when it comes to ministry matters you know which is actually uh, what is being um, talked about over here uh what is in your hands may be very little maybe your talents and skills are limited but whatever you do have thank the lord that he has given you at least that much to be able to go and serve him and minister to him take that little bit and step out in faith and start using it to the fullest to the best of your ability and you will discover that whatever he put in your hands is sufficient it is enough to minister to all the people that god is going to bring your way so um the two steps which jesus took in this unexpected situation which came upon them those two steps can be taken by all of us no matter what is in our hands we first need to thank the lord for it knowing fully that he already knew this would be happening so that is why he has placed that limited amount in your hand because he knows what he can do with it and second we choose to trust him and give our very best with that little and the lord will multiply it as in you know uh, how he regards it to be appropriate he will take care of the uh, finer details so um this is the conclusion that we see for this particular story uh, that would just be two verses maybe uh, if someone could read out that verses 12 and 13 verse 12 so when they were filled he said to his disciples gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were 
left over by those who had eaten all right so here we see that those um, you know five loaves and those two fish have multiplied to such an extent that there is actually a surplus left over how much surplus is left over 12 baskets full is left over why did god not provide exactly what is required for that number of people why did he provide extra why was there a surplus it was god demonstrating that he uh, for him there are no limits he was demonstrating that when he gives he gives generously he does not need to be stingy because you know his power is limited so he was showing how lavishly he can take care of our unexpected situations so when we step out in faith with thanksgiving you know um the lord can multiply whatever is available to an extent where there is um enough to cover all the uh, aspects of the situation that you are facing so we see that uh, this grand ending is given to this particular story uh, so that the people can learn a very vital important lesson about the character of god about the heart of god for his people and then from there we move into um a lot of dialogue which takes place between jesus and the people who have uh, you know seen uh, the miracle that has taken place uh, first maybe we could just look at um, the immediate response of the people and then after very lengthy dialogue uh, later uh, verses 14 and 15 if someone could read out then those men when they had seen the sign that jesus did said this is truly the prophet prophet who is to come into the world therefore when jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king he departed again to the mountain by himself alone yeah so the people say surely this is the prophet who is to come uh they are obviously referring to Deuteronomy chapter 18 uh Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 to 18 where you have Moses saying the lord your god will raise you raise up for you a prophet like me so uh Moses had prophesied that a prophet would be raised up who is like him and so when they see this miracle which Jesus has performed they immediately conclude that this must be the prophet why because you see in the in the wilderness where there were no shops available it was moses who miraculously provided the manna the bread which they ate and now jesus was doing exactly the same thing he was miraculously providing bread and so they conclude that this is exactly the kind of prophet which moses was talking about and uh, so they want to forcibly make him their king so that he can continue to provide for all of their material needs but jesus has not come into the world just to take care of material needs he in fact came to take care of the spiritual needs first foremost after that the material needs would anyway you know would be met so because of that he withdraws to the mountain because uh, they are not um they are not making him their king for the right reasons they want him to be king for the wrong reasons and so he withdraws from them and then you have this in incident which is which takes place uh, which kind of proves to the disciples that this is indeed the divine um, you know uh, messiah whom they have been waiting for so you have this in event on the lake taking place Uh, so yes if we could have, have someone um, read out for us uh, john chapter 6 verses 16 up to 21 yeah and when evening came his disciples went down to the sea got into the boat and went over the sea toward capernaum and it was now dark and jesus had not come to them then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing so when they had rode about 3 or 4 miles they saw jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat and they were afraid but he said to them it is i do do not be afraid 
then they willingly received him into the boat and immediately the boat was at land where they were going so it says that the wind was blowing very strong the waters were very rough under circumstances like that somebody is walking on the water and not drowning so this is not a calm uh, sea this is this is a storm happening on the uh, lake and in under such conditions someone is walking on the waters which is why the people assume that it must be an evil spirit uh, or a ghost but then jesus uh, speaks so that the, you know that hebrew phrase ego i me literally which means i am um in the old testament when yahweh identified himself uh, you know to moses he called himself i am and uh, so when, the, when that hebrew wording was translated into the greek uh, you know old testament the septuagint this is the exact greek wording which was used to translate the original wording ego i me which literally means i am so here in our english bibles the translation says it is i but literally what jesus says is i am don't be afraid so he is declaring his divinity and uh, you know then they they take him into the boat and then uh, uh, one more miracle takes place the minute he enters the boat the boat reaches the shore they don't travel the rest of the distance immediately the boat reaches its destination so it is extremely clear proof being given to this group of disciples that among them is no ordinary human this is literally the divine messiah as for the crowd which was kind of keeping you know uh, tabs on exactly where jesus is at which moment they are very very surprised because as far as they know only the disciples left in the boat and there were no other boats at that particular point of time so how did jesus get across from this side to that side that is the big question which they have and in fact they ask him that question um maybe we can look at we can maybe we can just simply read from uh, verse 25 onwards um and uh, we could maybe go all the way from verse 25 up to verse 30 yeah verses 25 to 30 please verse 25 and when they found him on the other side of the sea they said to him rabbi when did you come here jesus answered them and said most assuredly i say to you you seek me not because you saw the signs but because you ate of the loaves and were filled do not labor for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to everlasting life with the son of which the son of man will give you because god the father has set his seal on him then they said to him what shall we do that we may work the works of god jesus answered and said to them this is the work of god that you believe in him whom he sent therefore they said to him what signs will you perform then that we may see it and believe you what work will you do yes so um they start off by asking him how did you get here you know there were no boats available uh, so how did you come to this side of the shore of course jesus does not answer uh, but he addresses the actual reason why they have been desperately searching for him they have not been searching for him because they are hungry for spiritual truths they have been searching for him because they want someone who will provide free food so um jesus says to them very truly i tell you you know whenever jesus says very truly he is highlighting what's going to come next so he says very truly i tell you you are looking for me not because you saw the signs i performed but because you ate the loaves and had your fill do not work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life they saw the signs but it is not the sign uh, which made them search for jesus the fact that they had their stomach full uh, you know of food that is what made them search for jesus um wherever you see in the gospels miracles are called signs 
why is this term sign used for miracles because the miracles are signs which are pointing towards something they are like sign boards you know you would have heard that example being used um if you were traveling on the highway coming towards bangalore you will see a sign board saying you know another 8 kilometers to bangalore and then you know if you if you go a little far, farther you will see another arrow mark another sign board which will say just 3 kilometers left uh, to reach bangalore so these are sign boards which are pointing towards the city and they are indicating um how much further you need to go to reach the city so these miracles are all signs they are sign boards and they are pointing towards jesus and declaring look look this miracle is a sign that this is the messiah whom you have been waiting for so these people they saw the miracle of the food getting multiplied but they were not interested in what the sign board is saying they were not interested in his messiah ship they were they wanted a king who will provide them free food for the rest of their lives so jesus says you have not looking for me because you saw the signs but simply because you ate the loaves and had your fill and then he gives them a piece of advice and he says do not work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life because the food that you are you know so desperately pursuing tomorrow it will it will be gone you won't even need it i mean you know you will die once you are dead you're not going to be needing physical food anymore but the spiritual food that's something which can open up heaven for you it can open up eternity for you so he says don't work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life and um, so when jesus says work for food that endures they immediately ask him that that would be in verse 28 and they say what must we do to do the works god requires so if we are supposed to be working for uh, you know food which does not spoil what is this work what exactly are we supposed to do they are eager to do it and jesus says the work of god is this to believe in the one he has sent you know we go to god very eagerly and we say lord i want to do something for you what should i do give me and give me something to do the first thing before you do anything else the first thing is not a doing which god wants he wants a believing so the first act that god wants from us is complete absolute total trust start with that and then once you have that level of trust in him the doing will automatically come you will automatically start doing whatever is required to honor him to reach out to people to fill up his kingdom with the lost souls all of that will come because you have taken that first step of really placing your faith in him to an extent where you are now surrendered to him he can do what he wants with you because now you are ready you believe him you trust him you will follow him you will do what he says so the very first work which god wants from us his followers is that we totally truly trust him and not trust at a mind level intellectual level but trust at an action level where we are actually walking in obedience because there are things which he will ask us which are going to be painful and then whether we obey or not will display whether we trust or not if we trust him enough we will do what he is saying we will be, we will be like abraham when god said to him sacrifice your son he was willing to even take that step because he trusted god that much he said god promised me i would have descendants so even if i kill my son god will raise him from the dead that was the level of faith that abraham had so the very first step in in the ministry which we want to do for the lord the very first step is trust him believe in him so totally where you will be completely yielded and surrendered to him and then when you have that level of faith that kind of faith the doing will automatically come and the doing in fact will be easier because you already have that you know that trust relationship with the uh, lord and uh, so when he says the very first work which you should be doing is to believe in me you know that i am that i have been sent by god then they say 
you know, they again go back into question mode. They say, uh, what sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? You know, so this, uh, so the, you know, the bargaining begins all over again. Uh, that would be verses 30 onwards. Uh, maybe we could just have someone read out for us from verse 30 to verse 35. Therefore, they said to him, What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So when Jesus says the first work which you should do is to believe in me, they say, ah, you want us to believe that you have been sent by God, then give us a sign. What sign will you give? Uh, when, uh, when you know, our, our father, uh, our, our prophet Moses, uh, what did he do? He gave a wonderful sign. He gave us bread from heaven. So can you give us a sign like that? In other words, they're again trying to manipulate Jesus into providing free food. You know, because they're, they're right now, their eyes are fixed at the material level. They want material things. They are not interested in spiritual things. So they say, uh, Moses has given bread from heaven. And Jesus' immediate reply is this. Jesus says, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. He just gave you manna. You ate the manna, you digested the manna, and then you know you had to uh, you know, um, bring it out as human waste. It was not the true bread. The true bread is what my father gives. And that is you know, the life which comes. In verse 33, it says, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world eternal life so it's not actually moses who gave the true bread moses gave edible bread which could be eaten but that was just physical bread but true bread is the eternal life which only the father can give and he will give it to those who have who believe in the son whom he has sent because they are the people who you know who are feeding on Jesus, they are the ones who will stop being hungry. They are the ones who will stop being thirsty. People who eat physical food will get hungry again a few hours later. But the ones who choose to continue feeding on Jesus and his word, their hunger will be taken away. So Jesus is telling them, you know, you guys are perishing spiritually. I mean, you're so desperate for material things, but you realize that spiritually, you literally are perishing. You're finished. Tomorrow, if you die, you're not even going to enter heaven. So you desperately need spiritual things at the moment. So believe in me, you know, is what the Lord is actually urging them um, to, towards. Okay, so, um, so he begins to explain this in greater detail. And we would see that in verse 53 onwards. Uh, maybe we could have... Um, yeah, we can read from 53 all the way up to verse 60. 53 to 60. <laughs> Jesus 
Okay, so um, we uh, kind of you know moved into verse fifty-three and started reading. Uh, so over here, Jesus is giving an explanation about this uh, true bread of God. Uh, so he says, "I am that true bread." So he says, "You have whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them." So at that time, they were not familiar with the entire communion service, you know, the Lord's table. so they didn't that is not the picture which came to their minds when jesus said these words what picture would have come to their minds when jesus said you whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and i in them this was a metaphor which they used in those days you know in their uh, hebrew language to to eat and drink uh, something um it was a metaphor which they were familiar with they were they were very very clear that jesus is not talking about cannibalism here okay they were not concerned about that they knew that he is using a metaphor for instance if i am teaching you something and i say to you eat and drink what i am telling you i am basically saying these things which i am saying to you literally eat them drink them until they they go into your innermost being and they become a part of you you know take what i am saying very seriously eat it drink it absorb it into your very core that is what jesus is saying over here uh, only thing here he is not asking them to just absorb a set of teachings he is saying absorb me accept me as the divine messiah believe in me to such an extent that you eat and drink of me and literally absorb me into the very core of your being where you completely trust me where you are completely surrendered to me where you accept that i am the messiah and you submit to me and you know uh, accept me as your lord and when jesus says this the people are rather upset they say in verse 60 on hearing it many of his disciples the word that is used over there is disciples these are people who you know who have started following him they are they are people who are interested in his teachings and they have seen his miracles and they have kind of made a commitment but when he says this when he says you literally have to eat me and drink me and you know make me literally a part of you where you are totally surrendered to me that is a little too much for them that they should completely be surrendered to him they find that difficult and they say in verse 60 on hearing it many of his disciples said this is a hard teaching who can accept it so they are not finding this a hard teaching because they are thinking is talking about cannibalism no it explains why they are finding it a hard teaching that's in verse in, in the previous verse verse 59 where it says he said this while teaching in the synagogue in capernaum he is talking to the local crowd people who know him from childhood because capernaum is the place you know where he grew up and um, uh, so they've seen him uh, as a child they've seen seen him playing on the streets with their kids and now he is saying you have to accept me uh, my 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 messiahship you have to accept my divinity and messiahship to an extent where you are you know absorbing me into your very core and submitting to me and acknowledging me as lord they find that difficult because in their eyes he is the guy you know the boy who grew up in front of their eyes so they are finding it difficult and so um it says um after this you know many of them uh, they reject him and they leave uh, so in verses 41 and 42 which we you know skipped earlier which we did not cover but if you were to if you were to read those two verses that helps us to gain more perspective if someone could read out for us verses 41 and 42 of chapter 6 the jews then murder murmured against him because he said i am the bread which came down from heaven and they said is not this jesus the son of joseph whose father and mother we know how is it then that he says 
I have come down from heaven. So when Jesus started using that whole imagery of the true bread and that he is the true bread that has been sent by the father, that upsets them. And they say, we know this guy from childhood. I mean, we know his parents. He grew up in our town. Uh, so how can he claim that he has come down from heaven? You know, so that is what they are upset about. They are not refusing to believe in his divinity. And so now in verse 61, uh, this is what it says. This is what Jesus says to them. Uh, if we could have someone read out for us from verse 61 um, all the way up to verse 69. Yeah, 61 to 69, please. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, 70 and 71 as well. Yeah, 70, 71. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Je Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would be who, uh, he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So when, this, when Jesus was speaking these words in Kapernaum, the people found it difficult to accept what he is saying because they have seen him grow up in front of their eyes. So they say, how can he claim that he has come down from heaven? And Jesus says, does this offend you? He says in verse 61, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? So in fact, I wonder, you know, when Jesus goes to the, um, to the uh, Mount of Olivet, um, uh, you know, and um, uh, he's, he's, he, he ascends from there back into, the, into, the, into heaven. Um, maybe there were people, in fact, from his hometown also who witnessed that, you know, they would have stood over there and literally seen him ascending back to where he came from. And uh, so over here he says, uh, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. So Jesus is saying, I'm not from here. Yes, you have seen me grow in front of your eyes, but I'm actually not from here. I am from above. And so the words which I have spoken to you, he says, they are full of the spirit and life. If you feed on these words, if you believe in these words, if you absorb them into your very inner being, then what will you be full of? You also will be full of spirit and life. That is the value of the word of God. We can just read it. Maybe we can intellectually try to understand it. Uh, we can uh, maybe even preach on it. But if we have not chewed it, absorbed it into our very being, it doesn't help much. Because these words, they are full of the spirit and life. So anyone who actually feeds on this word of God every day, meditating upon it, allowing it to literally, you know, change the way they think, change the way they look at life, look at people, look at God. If they can allow this word of God to literally work in them, then... Because they have, you know, fed on this word, they will also become full of the spirit and life. So that is the power which is contained in the word of God. And uh, sadly, many of these people who had called themselves disciples from his hometown, at this point, 
they decided they can't believe it. You know, they're not willing to believe what Jesus is saying. So it says in verse 66, um, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And so Jesus looks at the 12 and he says, what about you? No, the others have left. They no longer believe in me. So what about you? Do you also want to leave? And Peter says, where will we go, Lord? You're the only one who has got the words of eternal life. Because that's what Jesus very plainly said, right? I am the true bread who has come. And I am the only one who can give eternal life. So that much the disciples have caught. They have understood that they can't get eternal life from anywhere else. So they say, we are going to stick with you because you are the only one who can you know, give us eternal life. And so they have made their decision. It's such a beautiful thing. you know. They have believed in him truly and they have made their commitment to stick with him because he is the only one who can impart to them eternal life. It's a beautiful childlike faith you know, which Peter displays over here. However, there is still one person among them among the 12 and Jesus says have I not chosen you the 12 yet one of you is a devil he meant Judas the son of Simon Iscariot who though one of the 12 was later to betray him what is the difference between these 11 disciples and this 12th guy maybe it's because you know when um, in the beginning when uh, Peter and Andrew and Philip first get to know about this Messiah. They're so excited. They say, this is the one that we have been waiting for. They are so interested in spiritual things. But Judas, we all know, right? He's not very interested in spiritual things. For him, money, money is a big thing. In fact, he loves money so much that we get to know later that he was you know, stealing from the, um, from the treasury. So um, this man, because he chose to focus on material things, his life stayed at the level of material things. So I will come back from the break and we'll get into the next chapter. Thank you. Hey, if you guys can just hold on.